Medicine is not a prescription, aortic valve disease. Let's talk about the history of Western medicine. How did it come about? Rockefeller founded Big Pharma and a pill for an ill trend. In the 1900s, petrochemicals along with vitamins were recently discovered and Rockefeller recognized the potentials of monopolizing the oil, chemical, and the medical industries all at the same time. Problem, natural herbal medicines were very popular and almost half the doctors and medical colleges were practicing holistic medicine. Solution, kill the competition. How? Andrew Carnegie, Rockefeller's buddy, who was monopolizing the steel industry at the time, was also the founder of the prestigious Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Process. Send Abraham Flexner, a teacher from the Carnegie Institute, to travel around the country and generate a report on the status of medical colleges and hospitals. And guess what? The Flexner Report of 1910 presented the need for revamping and centralizing medical institutions. Result, 50% of medical schools were shut down, homeopathy and natural medicines were mocked and demonized, and holistic doctors were jailed. A hundred years later, allopathic medicine is definitely the new trend. And we now have the Rockefeller Medicine Men. Okay, body components and functions. This is the usual body organ chart that we took in med school, but recently recognized body organs are starting to show up. And today we'll be talking about the fascia. So fascia is a sheath or cable made of fibrous tissue that interpenetrates and surrounds muscles, bones, organs, nerves, blood vessels, as well as other structures. Known functions, well, being fibrous tissue, it provides support to adjacent tissue. It serves as an electron highway because it has the least impedance to electron flow in the body. It plays a major role in the circulation of blood and lymph, nutrition and metabolism of all body cells, as well as, as serving as immunity's first line of defense. So any disruptions or restrictions within the fascia are associated with disease and movement impairments. So allow me to introduce my colleague, Cody Williams, who is a structural therapist at Sterling Structural Therapy. But today, good, please giggle and whistle, for the love of, yes, good. For today, Cody is Monsieur Fascia, okay? And I'm going to torture him and give him all sorts of fascia restrictions. Uh, now, before I do, Cody's fascia suit is healthy. And notice the cobwebs, right? They're doing well, right? So he can lift his arms, he can move, he can go hike, um, he can go play tennis, he can do it, he can tie his shoes, no pain, okay? No problem. I'm about to change that. So I'm going to give Cody a myofascial restriction at his right rib cage and armpit. And if you can already see, he's already having to adapt a little bit against this. Good. So now, Cody, go ahead and try to lift both arms up for me. And we're going to just, woo, good. Okay, so can you see that his range of motion is restricted, restricted right now? Really try to lift them up higher, Cody. Okay, now drop them back down because, ow, that's not fun. Now, this makes sense, right? You can imagine how this is going to create this restriction. Did you notice what happened at his left shoulder over here? Uh huh, yeah? So go ahead, lift both of them again. A fascial restriction here is causing some serious range of motion issues over here. Now let's drop that down and I'm going to give him a fascial release and fix him up and now woohoo, yeah. Did you notice him kind of move his neck? That can, is not comfortable in the neck either. Just going to give you a brief example, a client that came to see us, fully torn rotator cuff. The surgeon said, sorry, can't repair it, fully torn. She now has that full range of motion and no more pain because we actually helped her modify her fascial restriction, and she changed certain habits to not recreate it. So it's actually incredibly adaptive, okay? Your body is incredibly adaptive. It does not rely on just one small little muscle, and there are even four little rotator cuff muscles if you create balance elsewhere. So how do electrons on the macro scale? 
The human body has two wiring systems, both of which are made of fibrous tissue. The fibrous encasement of nerves, we all know, is the analog perineural nervous system, and the fascia, which is the acupuncture system conveyor. The acupuncture system is a system of channels connecting the surface of the body to internal organs. Cells are designed to run between a pH of 7.35 and 7.45, which is actually a measurement of voltage. So, every cell in our body is a battery, and we need to maintain our health by healing primarily by making new cells. But to make new cells requires a voltage of minus 50 millivolt. And notice here that at plus 30 millivolts, cancer starts to occur. So pH is simply a symptom of abnormal voltage. In anything less than 7.35, we have chronic pain. Anything over 7.45, we get throbbing pain. So everything is about the electrical gradient. This is a demonstration with a voltmeter and notice the readings. One, Zero, five, six. Twenty-eight. Forty. Forty-one. Now remember, we said cancer at plus thirty millivolts. Okay. Everything in nature always surrounds the middle, okay? So unless there's something to intervene, everything will eventually equilibrize. Right, so this uh, is a Galfin board uh, because the first person to make one of these and uh, name it after themselves was called uh, Galton. And what you do is you take a ball, you drop it into the top, and it bounces off all these nails before eventually going into one of these categories. Uh, and when the ball hits each nail, in theory, there is a 50-50 chance of it going left or right. And so each path is pretty much unpredictable. If we put in absolutely loads of these balls, even though each individual one we couldn't accurately predict where it's going to end up, we can accurately predict the overall pattern from lots of them. Right, and that pattern we end up with is called uh, the normal distribution. In fact, we've got a few too many in the middle there. Uh, you, now, a lot of things in nature follow this pattern. Uh, if you measure people's height, they will follow a normal distribution. Shoe sizes. Uh, a lot of things in science and uh, engineering and maths match this kind of bell-shaped curve. Uh, in fact, uh, those of you, if you've done A-level maths, you will know that because the ball has choices of going left or right on each one, this is actually a binomial distribution. And if you have lots and lots of balls going down, as you get more and more of them, it gets closer and closer to exactly matching the normal distribution. During life, we may take things and we also give things. So we have the electron stealer and we have the electron donor. Electron donor examples, muscular system. Crystalline arrangements are the rule in living tissue. These crystals generate electric fields when compressed or stretched, and muscles act as rechargeable batteries on exercise by creating electrons. This is something that was newly discovered, the craniosacral rhythm. The skull bones expand and contract at 6 to 12 times per minute, gently shortening and lengthening the spine, exchanging and circulating to CSF, while protecting the brain and spinal cord from severe injury. Schumann field effect tells us that whenever a fluid moves within a magnetic field, electrons are generated, so that with every craniosacral beat, a surge of electrons is sent through the body. And the same thing with running water. When a river runs downhill within the Earth's magnetic field, electrons are added to the water. We have inanimate donors as well as animate donors, raw vegetables and fruits. 
Okay, electron stealers. Acidic tap water. Chlorinated water. Most bottled water. Standing water. Processed and cooked foods. Moving air. Wind, air conditioning, fans, convertibles, and hair dryers. All of those steal electrons. Other electron stealers. Your patient. I'm pretty sure you steal from your kids. Unless they're sick. And you definitely steal from your dogs if you have one. But that's okay because as soon as they go back outside, they recharge their batteries. How cells stores electrons, okay? Cell membranes are made up of opposing layers of fats called phospholipids, made up of a ball with two legs. Now this is simplifying Tesla's concepts. The ball is the electron conductor. The legs are insulators. And when two conductors are separated by an insulator, you have a capacitor. Capacitors are designed to store electrons. And the phospholipid legs here can twist or untwist to permit or block light or water or other molecules through the cell membrane. And they open and close depending upon the voltage applied. So cell membranes serve as battery packs for the cells. Let's take this example. Our heart cells, like all other body cells, are operating at a voltage of minus 25 millivolts. During a heart attack, the heart muscle cell becomes deprived. But if the cell's voltage can automatically go to minus 50 millivolts, the cells will have the potential. And notice I'm saying potential of healing because other things are required for the healing. So at minus 50 millivolts, the blood vessels will dilate to bring raw materials into the vicinity for use. And it is also the energy level which is needed to incorporate these raw materials into the cells. So no medications or surgeries can achieve healing without cells being capable of achieving minus 50 millivolt, availability of necessary raw materials, and removal of toxins and precipitating agents. So basically cells need the following to be healthy. Water, fats to make cell membranes, Amino acids to make cytoplasm, vitamins to allow the body to make the fats and proteins work, minerals to make the fats and proteins work as on off switches and to keep your pH in the operating range, oxygen, sunshine, and the voltage of minus 20 to minus 25. Resources oxygen. Let's just Remember together here, the fat cell with oxygen goes through Krebs cycle to give us 38 ATPs. With the fat cell, with anaerobic respiration, can only give us two ATPs, which is really, really inefficient metabolic process. So ATP, ADP, ATP form a rechargeable battery that provides the electrons that maintain cell function. The water voltage decreases the amount of oxygen capable of dissolving in water. So a voltage as it drops, as the voltage drops, oxygen comes out of solution and leaves the water. Flash, all human blood is infected with bacteria and healthy human blood microbiome is what everybody's talking about right now. Blood was assumed to be sterile because placing blood in a petri dish did not normally show any growth. However, only bacteria that have cell membranes can reproduce in petri dishes, and the microorganisms in the blood do not have cell membranes. So, our bodies contain over a trillion microorganisms that, once oxygen levels drop, they become activated. They attack voltage deficient cells by secreting digestive enzymes to acquire the nutrients from the cells, and their toxins can then circulate in the bloodstream and cause damage to any low voltage organ. Okay, body components and functions. Fat. Our body is made of 25% fat. Our body completely replaces itself every eight months. 25% of our normal body weight in saturated fat needs to be provided and absorbed every eight months to maintain health. 
Today's food market is primarily providing us with trans fats, plastic fats. So eating these fats, these plastic fats, transforms the cell membranes into plastic, which is incapable of holding any voltage. With that said, let's discuss type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, and obesity. What's going on here? Okay. The cell sends us signals that it is hungry. In response, the body sends glucose and insulin to the cell. Insulin glucose can't get through the plastic membrane. The cell continues to signal that it is hungry, and the body continues to send insulin and glucose. The cell is surrounded by insulin and glucose, but the cell is still hungry. The cell membrane becomes so saturated with glucose that it begins to offload it into fat cells. So people who continue to eat plastic fats get fatter and fatter. Examples of the cumulative effects of having plastic surroundings for the cells. Plastic brain. It becomes so prone to depression, chronic fatigue, attention deficit, and brain fog. Plastic liver can't clean toxins, causing things like fibromyalgia. Nothing's working properly here. And without a functional liver, the immune system fails, leading to all sorts of chronic infections. Unsaturated fat results in the cells being in constant starvation, well coated with glucose that cannot enter the cell. Solution, eat saturated fats to replace the unsaturated plastic fats. The liver needs 50 to 90 grams saturated fat per day to maintain health. Bile is needed for fat absorption. Hmm. So you're going to have to give bile supplements with each meal until the liver is repaired enough to make its own bile. Body cycles and rhythms, I, I think this is also... Some of these were really discovered. Uh, cardiovascular, the circadian control of brain lymphatic and lymphatic fluid. Craniosacral. Circadian myth. You've got your endocrine hormones. You've got your 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 iron. Did you know iron is just its maximum at noon? Okay, and so on and so forth. And you have the 24-hour clock. Quantum. Biology. Let's take just 60 seconds to talk about this. Okay. Quantum mechanics. This is important because we're operating at a subcellular level, subatomic level. Okay. So you have to know the mechanisms that are going on around you. Quantum mechanics is the branch of physics that describes the behavior of particles in the subatomic realm in which there is, okay, superposition where a particle can be in two places at once while also occurring in two different states as a particle for example in a wave coherence states that all parts of a wave stick together the excitant as a wave peels out all possible pathways it finds the most efficient one and takes it tunneling this is where a particle can pass through a solid object like it was a ghost, like there's nothing there. Entanglement. This is where two particles form a relationship. So that wh whether they're an inch apart or galaxies apart, anything affecting one object will instantaneously affect the other. Spooky action at a distance, and this term is coined by Einstein, or one particle could vanish from an area and just pop up somewhere else. So you can't talk about quantum mechanics without discussing the double slit lamp experiment. Okay, they took an electron beam gun and then it shoots one electron at a time and they shot through with the electron beam gun through a double slit screen like this one and to their surprise just one electron gave this interference pattern, like it was a wave, okay? So what they did next was that they took the camera and they put it here so that they can look directly at the electron being fired. And to their surprise again, that one electron 
okay, behaved like it was supposed to. And it bombarded just one spot on the screen. So explain that. Physics. Okay, there's something terribly wrong with our science. So each quantum entity has dual potential properties which become an actual characteristic if and when it is observed. Quantum physics is a science of possibilities rather than exactness of Newtonian physics. In other words, so long as this has not landed on something and it has not been seen, it has the potential of being a six, a two, a one, a five, and so on. So quantum objects in quantities become actual when observed. They have the potential to be anything else until they're observed. So biology cannot explain our dependency on light for survival. It, it, it can't explain photosynthesis in plants. It cannot explain sulfated vitamin D3 in humans. And as you know, we need the light to, to maintain our circadian rhythms. Biology cannot explain smell. Biology cannot explain how we see our vision. Quantum biology, however, can. So I think this is the dawn for quantum biology. And if you're not thinking quantum, you are looking through tunnel vision and you are missing out on so much paucity in knowledge. And fascia is a brand new concept in medicine and rehabilitation. It's only about seven to ten years old, the research on this. It's really important that we actually connect it to what we already know to get a better understanding. Now, this is sometimes, those two systems will sometimes be called the musculoskeletal system. I'm about to tell you about a third system, a massive one, that actually connects those two to each other. And this system has been summarily ignored in rehabilitation and medicine actually for hundreds of years. So how it's been ignored is that the way we study anatomy to understand how to better help people recover is through cadaver dissection. And for hundreds of years, when we are doing cadaver dissection, we have simply been cutting away this fascia connective tissue and literally throwing it in the garbage bin. So. When I went to college, which was not hundreds of years ago, but a little while ago, um, same thing. We were just taught to cut it away so you can look and study the muscle and look and study the bone, look at the attachment and origin. We were actually taught that fascia is simply packing material. And we're not an Amazon package. <laughs> okay? We are brilliantly designed. Everything in there is for a reason. What we're finding out, like those two blue diagrams that you see behind me, not only does fascia matter, but it has very specific lines of pull. And if you could look at those two diagrams, can you imagine if someone has a fascia restriction through this that will alter their muscles and their bone positions, that they, their posture might change, and then their range of motion, and maybe they'll develop some issues based on this. Now, the image in the center is very useful because I want you to think as your fascia as your birthday suit. <laughs> it's the organ of form. And those two images on the side is actually fascia when magnified times 25. It looks like cobwebs. So it's literally the cobwebs that make you who you are. Now, fascia is an interesting thing. Another reason that it's been summarily ignored even in modern day medicine is guess what? Fascia does not show up in MRIs, X-rays, or CT scans. So imagine someone's having an issue and they're getting some imaging done, and I'm not gonna argue that their images are showing possible stenosis, bone on bone, etc. That is true, but there's another big piece of the puzzle that's simply being ignored. Can you imagine getting a diagnosis and treatment based on seriously incomplete data? You have to realize that as far as cardiology is concerned, we're also affected by any deformities in the spinal column. Because, for instance, pigeon chest, okay, it gives us murmurs. And fascia is a brand new... Con 
where we recently discovered cytoplasmic DNA that triggers inflammation in human cells and causes ptosis. We have recently discovered new life that lives off electricity. Electricity eaters, they eat electrons directly. They have bypassed all the metabolic processes that we do. They've discovered that we come into this life with a spark of light. They've discovered that cells can communicate using light. And this is only in 2012. They've discovered that the brain has a drainage of lymphatics, and this was in 2017. Okay, in 2018, they've discovered the interstitium, and they've labeled it an organ, and they discovered that the collagen bundles are not just collagen bundles. The collagen bundles have fluid fill spaces around them. And this is in 2018, for God's sake. The mesentery has been labeled an organ. They've discovered blood vessel networks inside bones. And this was in 2019. The fibula makes a comeback in 2018. We now have the sniffing kidney. And this was two years ago that they discovered this. We have a new role for the lungs for making blood. Okay, the lungs produce most blood platelets and can replenish the blood-making cells in the bone marrow. They verified the xenon effect, which says that atoms will not move as you watch them. And now chemistry world, they want to bring quantum tunneling to the table when trying to understand reactions. And it's about time they did this because everything is occurring. They have no idea what's going on the subcellular level, subatomic levels. Now, this should be interesting for our friends in the EPS. The effects of acupuncture on cardiac arrhythmias, a literature review. Let's read this part together. According to eight studies reviewed, 87 to 100% of participants converted to normal sinus rhythm after acupuncture. So acupuncture seems to be effective in treating several cardiac arrhythmias. But the limited methodologic quality of the studies necessitates better controlled clinical trials. So it would be interesting to see more trials on this. The mother and child brain synchronize during problem solving. This has been verified. And my take home message. Okay. Aortic valve disease, take home message. What are your antibiotics doing to the blood microbiome? Do the guidelines provide treatment to ongoing valvular destruction, calcification, or fibrosis? Are your patients living carefree lives? Are your patients complying to your medications? Are you tailoring your medications to your patient? Or are you tailoring your patient to your medications, especially with warfarin? Are your patients socially and psychologically fit to respond to your treatment? Are you searching, researching? every patient like he or she or one of your family and tailoring your medications accordingly? Are you following your patient's diet and exercise routine and lifestyle? Is the diet meeting the required quota of the necessary raw material for your patient to heal? Are they exercising enough to, to have the necessary voltage they need to heal? What is the source of patient's drinking water? Is it fit for human consumption? Does it comply with your patient's needs? So, my take home message briefly is the S and SNAPS. Okay, do your homework, do your research, innovate, and leave your thumbprint in the medical community. This is something I found to be very, very interesting, and I think this is worth looking into. Happy therapy. Okay, epitherapy has been proven for the useful for these cardiovascular diseases. And you can see here at the top, acute rheumatic carditis, angina pectoris, arrhythmias, okay, and so on, as well as for all of these other disease entities. And I will be leaving you with a recap of everything that I've been talking about in this video. Thank you for your attention.
If the health of living cells is governed by voltage, then an obvious concern in modern society is the rapidly growing pervasiveness of wireless technologies. We asked Dr. Tennant to identify some of the greatest obstacles we should be aware of today. Well, there's no doubt that we have all sorts of things that, uh, that affect us. You know, for example, if I had you hold your arm straight out and check, push down on it, you would be strong. And then if I had you take a wristwatch with a battery in it and hold it right up against your chest and I pushed on your arm, you would go weak. So again, when we put electromagnetic energy within our, magnet, our personal magnetic field, it weakens us. Our particular frequencies are weaken us. And so we're being bombarded with that sort of thing all the time. Here's the bottom line of the whole thing. We are constantly wearing ourselves out. So you get new cells in the macula of your eye every 48 hours. The lining of your gut's replaced every three days. The skin you're sitting in today is six weeks old. Your liver's eight weeks old and your nervous system eight months old. So as cells wear out, you have to make new ones. Or if the cells get damaged some way, you have to make new ones. So chronic disease only occurs when you lose the ability to make new cells at work. Let me say that one more time. Chronic disease only occurs when you lose the ability to make new cells at work, which leads one to the question, well, what's it take to make a new cell that works? Well, first of all, where cells run at minus 25 millivolts of energy, it takes minus 50 millivolts to make a new cell. So you have to have the voltage. Then you have to have all the parts it takes to make a cell. You know, if a tornado blows your house down, you can't build a house back with doorknobs and bathroom tiles. You have to have everything it takes to make a house. And that's one of the big mistakes people make when they say, well, I'm trying to get well. And you say, well, take this stuff. They come back later and you say, well, you're still taking all this stuff. No, I just wanted to know what thing, what one thing worked. So I've just been taking one thing at a time. Well, nothing works. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Again, that concept of I want to know what works won't work because you have to have everything it takes to make a cell. And that's the nutrition piece, of course. So we have to have 50 millivolts of, of energy. We have to have all the parts it takes to make a cell. And we have to get rid of any toxins that damage cells as fast as you make them. So if you don't do all three of those things, you, you won't get well. One then goes in and looks at each of those. So for example, the voltage piece, we're able to measure the voltages in the circuits using something similar to the Nakatani or Vol uh, methodology. But one of the important things to understand is that it's well known in, in battery technology that if you take a rechargeable battery and you drain it all the way to zero, it'll flip itself upside down, flips the polarity. Well, if you take a battery upside down, put it in a battery charger, it won't take a charge, of course. So what we do is we go through and we can measure the polarity of every circuit in your body and figure out which ones are upside down. And those are the ones where you're going to be sick because you don't have juice. And those circuits are trying to borrow voltage from the next door neighbors. But I like to say the neighbors will give you a cup of sugar now and then, but they won't give you three meals a day. There are two kinds of energy in the universe of, that I'm aware of, electromagnetic and then scalar. And of course, scalar has the ability to reverse the polarity back to normal. So we have a device that will do that called a biotransducer. And we simply uh, can put it on um, one of the acupuncture spots in the body and all your batteries get turned back up. Of course, they're still discharged. Then we take the biomodulator, which puts out a specific waveform and recharge your batteries back up. Now your battery has power again. And then the body never forgets how to repair itself. Just that it has to have the power to do it, has to have the materials to do it. So no matter what's wrong with you, again, you asked me about neurology, uh, nephrology, cardiology, any of the ologies, you treat them all the same way because they're all sick for the same reason. They lost the ability to make new cells at work or, and or they lost the power to run. You can't have a heart that works if it's trying to run on 5 millivolts instead of 25 millivolts, right? You can't have a, a macula in your eye that works. All macular degeneration is because you've lost power in the stomach circuit, which is the power, the stomach circuit is acupuncture circuits, the power supply to the macula. So anytime somebody has macular degeneration you will, and you measure it, you'll always find 
there's no there's inadequate power and it's reversed the polarity in the stomach circuit whereas glaucoma the optic nerves on a different circuit it's on the liver circuit and so everybody every time you see a glaucoma patient and measure it the liver circuit will have flipped its polarity so how do you treat it you flip the polarity back you charge the battery back up and then you figure out why did the battery lose its charge in the first place well there are five basic reasons one is that you have to look at thyroid hormone because thyroid controls the voltage of every cell membrane in the body T3 controls uh, the voltage of the cell membranes and the number of mitochondria. T2 controls the function of the mitochondria. So you always, let's say you don't have enough thyroid hormone, your battery discharges to here. Now if you put a scar across one of your circuits and it touches the fascia, it shorts it out like any other electronic short. So wherever you have scars, that's going to short out that circuit. So many women have a, a C-section scar which goes right across the stomach circuit. The spleen stomach circuit is the entire reproductive system, the entire endocrine system, the thinking part of the brain, the macula, the eye. Okay, so thyroid takes us down to here, scars take us down to here. Dental infections, since every circuit goes through specific teeth, if you have an infection in a tooth, it acts like a resistor and drops the voltage. All right, dental infections takes you down to here. Emotions are stored in the body as magnetic fields, as I discussed in my lecture to the Electric Universe. And all of us have emotions, but if you have a wire and you put a magnetic field around it, it blocks the flow of voltage. That's how emotions drop our voltage and make us sick. Thyroid, scars, dental infections, emotions, and finally toxins, and now your battery is drained to zero and flips upside down, and there you go, you're sick. One of the problems with American medicine is that the scientists say we have to isolate everything else and look at just this one thing to see if it's the cause of the disease. It almost never is. Almost all diseases are multifactorial. And that's why we have such a hard time in American medicine finding the cause because it's almost always several causes that flip the voltage. Then when you don't have voltage, as voltage drops, oxygen drops because the amount of oxygen that will dissolve in a liquid is dictated by the voltage of the liquid. When you lose voltage, you lose oxygen. When you lose oxygen, your metabolism becomes inefficient, infections show up, and when you get to plus 30 millivolts, you have cancer. Simple as that.